she has stickers all over my hands. Good to be with you this morning. I appreciate every opportunity that I have to share a message in God's Word, and I just want to thank everybody for being here this morning, and thankful for our visitors. We're glad that you're here. I uh, hope that you find our worship here uh, acceptable, and pray that you find it beneficial, and as has been mentioned already, it is Memorial Day weekend, and so incredibly thankful for those who have been willing to lay down their lives that we may have the freedoms and liberties that we do enjoy, and if there is to be freedom, then there has to be those who are willing to stand in the gap, and just as if, more importantly, with Jesus Christ, our Savior, to be free from sin for all eternity, he was willing to stand in the gap in our stead. So with that, I would like to say that Starting out, if we're honest with ourselves, I believe we often take many things for granted. We take freedom for granted. Uh, many times we take what Jesus did for us for granted. Bible study is no exception. Uh, I think, you know, many of us grew up in the church. Uh, we've heard many Bible stories and passages discussed the same way for years and years, and we might not ever give anything a second thought. Sometimes we tell ourselves, well, folks I trust have always taught it this way, and I don't see any reason to not trust them. Or uh, brother so-and-so is much more well-studied than I am, so he must be right. You know, we don't stop to think critically about what we're studying or what we're believing. Sometimes we don't understand why we believe what we believe. Uh, I think, it's, you know, that kind of thinking can be kind of lazy at best and spiritually dangerous at worst. And this sort of thing isn't just true for us, but it's true for anyone who claims to be a Bible believer, and it's true for any field of study. So you may or may not be familiar with this person. His name is Francis Chan. Um, he once pastored a megachurch out in Los Angeles, and he's written several books. He's known by millions across the world. Uh, I personally have read three of his books, and I found them all incredibly helpful and, and insightful. But knowing his background, I was kind of surprised when reading, I think it was uh, his book, Crazy Love, that he challenged his reader to, to question everything they knew about the sinner's prayer or this belief that all you have to do to be saved is to say this particular prayer that somebody else made up and voila you're saved he gave the reader this illustration he said imagine you were dropped off on a desert island and all you have is the bible if you read through it like it was the first time ever would you ever find the sinner's prayer or even an instruction on saying a prayer so that you may be saved he continued by asserting to the reader that you only believe this because somebody else told you to. Furthermore, he asked the reader that as they study through the book of Acts, is it clear to you that you must repent? Is it clear to you that you need to be baptized? Is it clear to you that you need to receive the Holy Spirit? And coming from Francis Chan and the audience that he has, that was very profound. He walked away from his megachurch, and he even stated that he and others needed to repent for contributing to basically this cheap form of worship that influenced so many, and he now works on helping establish more primitive churches that more closely align with the scriptures. And I was impressed with that, because each of us needs to be that kind of honest with ourselves about what we believe. We need to be willing to go to the scriptures openly and willingly challenge what we believe, and I Along that line, I really enjoyed having Barry Kirchhoff here last summer uh, in the series of lessons that he did. He challenged me greatly. Uh, I took his advice. I started doing some Bible studies where I would read the scriptures aloud and let it sink in more deeply. Uh, I tried to really thoroughly examine what I was reading more than I was before, and I found those efforts fruitful. So this morning, the lesson that I have prepared to share with you, I hope is going to challenge us because I know it challenged me, and there goes the microphone already. Um, I wrote this lesson actually a few months ago and I've been, I guess, looking for an opportunity to use it and I wasn't expecting that it would be this weekend but Wayne called me Wednesday night and asked me if I wanted to preach and I told him no. And 30 minutes later I called him back I said, I changed my mind, I'll do it. <laughs> so I just took it as a sign, I guess, that maybe it was time to deliver this lesson. Um, I've come away with a different set of thoughts regarding a well-known Bible story that I think I've believed a certain way for most of my life until the last few months. And please understand, I have no intention when I have these opportunities to speak 
of delivering status quo cookie cutter lessons that just want to confirm what you already believe or confirm what I already believe. I'm not here to pat myself on the back. I'm not here to pat you on the back. I'm not here to maintain an echo chamber. Um, I think it's incumbent that if I dare teach from God's word that I always must do it in such a way that is sincere, that is critically thought out, that has the purpose of challenging each of us to grow closer to Christ. I'm not up here to preach Josh King. I'm up here to preach the Word of God. And I'm up here to do that as best I know how and as best I understand. So if I do say anything today that troubles you, I do ask, please, be forbearing. So with that, we've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. I want us to take an examination of the story of David and Bathsheba. Like many Christians, I was taught growing up and believed for a very long time that David and Bathsheba had a consensual affair. And upon closer inspection of these scriptures, however, I'm no longer certain that's the case, and I hope to clearly explain to you why I've come to that conclusion and share some important lessons that I believe can be learned from that point of view. So let me begin in uh, verse 1 of chapter 11. The scriptures start off, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. So right off the bat, we see something. David is not where he's supposed to be. In the springtime, kings go off to war. David stayed behind. For whatever reason, he stayed home. We're not told why, but we are told that this is pretty much uncharacteristic for a king to not be with his army and be with his commanders. And the author specifically wants us to know that David stayed home rather than going to war this particular spring. Now I think we're already starting off where we see how one poor decision can potentially lead to additional or a series of poor decisions. Picking up in verse 2, And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So a lot transpires over these few verses. We see that David arose from his couch. He walked out onto the roof from the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and he saw that the woman was very beautiful. So there are some things to note here, and I think this is where a lot of us have gotten crossed up. I know, I have gotten crossed up. Because when I heard a preacher talking about this not long ago, and he's kind of what drew my attention to it, because I'm like, that doesn't sound right, but let me go back and look. We read this and think that David saw her bathing from her roof. I don't think that's accurate. I think the roof being referenced is the roof of the king's house that David walked out onto because it was from the roof that David saw her. It was not from a roof he saw her, the roof. The roof in question is David's roof. And if we aren't careful, I think that simple mistake in grammar might skew our whole view of this entire account. We're not actually told where David saw her. We're not even told, I mean, perhaps she was on a roof. Maybe she was seen through an open window. Maybe he saw her from a pool. There are several plausible possibilities. We're simply not told where her location is. We're not even told that she's naked, to be honest. I think many of us have simply assumed all of these things about her. When in fact, we just don't know. We're not told. Further, we're not even told that she saw or even noticed David. Just that he noticed her. Remember, David is supposed to be at war. He's not supposed to be at home. If she thinks he's at battle and knowing that she's in view of the king's roof, she may think she's safe to bathe wherever she is. So I think we need to be careful not to assign any impure motivation on her part without evidence. How we interpret these first few verses, I believe, can have a profound impact on how we see the entirety of this story. I think it's important that we look carefully here and maintain an open mind. 
Because we notice that David wants to know more of the woman that he has seen. And at least one other person is perhaps with him on the roof and recognizes her as the wife of Uriah the Hittite, a Gentile. Or he recognizes her by David's descriptions. Don't know. Nonetheless, David sends his messengers. And the scriptures tell us that they took her. Took is the verb being used. And that she came to him and that he lay with her. These are the details that we have. The scriptures also tell us that she was purifying herself of her uncleanness. Well, what, is this, what does this mean? This is an important detail. In Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 19, the law states, You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in menstrual uncleanness. So Bathsheba was bathing herself according to the law. Whereas David was not where he belonged in doing what he was supposed to be doing, she was doing exactly what she was supposed to be doing. If this is the reason for her bathing, to honor the law, I personally find it very difficult to impose any other motive on her part, especially without any scriptural evidence. In verse 20, the law continues, And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife, and so make yourself unclean with her. So, Presumably Bathsheba was Jewish and her husband Gentile. And despite Uriah being a Gentile, in Leviticus 19 verses 33 to 34, the law also forbade David from not loving Uriah as himself either. David is the one so far who's clearly in the wrong, and he has clearly violated the law already at multiple junctures. And after David lay with her, Bathsheba returned to her house, and we see that she conceived, which means there's a period of three or four weeks that have passed by, and the scriptures don't reveal that David sought after her again. So is this a one-night stand? Or is it perhaps something else? Maybe something worse. Now you might be thinking, Josh, if you're alleging David sexually abused Bathsheba, the scriptures don't tell us she cried out for help either. Well... There's something more specific to that portion of the law. And Deuteronomy 22 specifically speaks of a betrothed virgin must cry out if in the city. Not just any woman. We're not told Bathsheba is a virgin. She's described as a wife and not a betrothed wife. So this portion of the law, therefore, would not apply to her circumstance. So my question is, if we think that, what is she supposed to do? David is the king. Her husband's at war. David's men took her from her home. David surely understands the law, but yet he goes around the law and abuses his power as king to take advantage of his neighbor's wife while that same neighbor is currently risking his neck for David at war. Pretty low down, to be honest. And if this is a consensual affair, then David and Bathsheba should have been put to death according to Deuteronomy 22.22. They should have been stoned. Right? Moreover, his servants that were complicit to his instructions would be in violation of the law. Except, according to the scriptures, and what we know, no execution occurred. Therefore, I'm contending that consent does not necessarily appear to be present on the part of Uriah's wife. Now, I think the truth is here, Bathsheba has very little recourse. A woman back then has little to no rights. Quite literally, she's at the mercy of others, and she's got a husband away from home. He's at war. She's supposed to be able to trust King David. To whom exactly should she have cried out to? The men outside that followed his orders? I mean, who in Israel is going to walk in and challenge King David? As his son, I believe Solomon put it in Ecclesiastes 8.4, For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, What are you doing? King David's authority would have been feared by all Jews. So exactly, who, if she cries out for help, who's she going to cry out to? Who's going to come in and rescue her? Things like this still happen today. People in positions of power and authority abuse their offices and take advantage of those with little to no power, little to no rights, and little to no recourse. Lack of resistance, whether known or unknown, does not necessarily equal consent. Perhaps she's in shock. Maybe she thought her visit to the palace was regarding news of her husband. Again, he's at war. Perhaps she was frightened for her life. Maybe she did put up a struggle. We're simply just not told these details. We're not told she consented. 
be very careful to assume she did. Because later in this story, I think we're going to see passages that allude to the probability she did not. That she was not a willing participant. In any case, David still used his power of his position to violate not only his neighbor, but the wife of his neighbor. And that is a form of abuse. And under the law, it was punishable by death. But again, who exactly is going to walk in and stone the king? Let's pick up in verse 6. Let's read through verse 13. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and he did not go down to his house. And when they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So after David finds out he's fathered this child, he sends for Uriah. What he wants to do is get Uriah to come home to sleep with his wife so that he can save face and not take responsibility. That's just what I see occurring. This is not an entirely secret matter. I mean, David did use some of his men to help him orchestrate this sin. We might expect some word to start getting around. Uriah is a Hittite. He's not an Israelite. So essentially, he's a mercenary in David's army. He wouldn't be a high-ranking official like a commander or a captain. So I'd imagine that receiving news that David wants to see someone like him would be a fearful thing. And the thought's like, why does the king want to see me? Who am I to him? You know, his first thoughts are probably wondering if he's done something wrong. I mean, that's how I feel if I was in his shoes. I mean, whenever I'm at work and one of my coworkers stops by and pokes their head in my office and says, hey, man, boss man wants to see you. In my mouth, or why? What did I do wrong? Am I in trouble? You know, it's only natural to think like that. But in the process of leaving the war camp and returning to the palace, I think Uriah would no, would no doubt have taken the same roads as the supply chain from Jerusalem to the front lines. All right? And if you served in the military, you know on supply chains, there's a lot of gossip, there's a lot of scuttlebutt in those ranks. Uriah, I suspect, was likely trying to find out anything he could as to why David wanted to see him. And I think it's entirely plausible he found out what happened along the way or soon after. Again, it's not like they had cell phones back then. They can just pop them out and jump on Twitter and see what's going on back home. So he's probably really trying to find out, hey, why does David want to see me? And I based that thought on the fact that, you know, Uriah refused David's encouragements and gifts. David even conspired to get him drunk. And there's an honor and shame component very prevalent in this culture. And it's still there in that culture today and in the Far East. Uh, that's a whole other lesson in of itself, you know, in comparison to the West. But David, David's trying to save face about having fathered this child with Uriah's wife. And I think his plan is to get Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba so that he can say the child is Uriah's. Right? It's not like they're just going to go on Maury Povich and Maury Povich is going to walk out with a manila envelope and with a paternity test that says, David, you are the father. If David can sow seeds of doubt by getting Uriah to go back home to his wife, he can basically claim fact, no, that's not my child, that's your eyes. So he can sow seeds of doubt by having sown his seed unlawfully. The problem for David here is that, as we just read, Uriah is not obliging at all. In fact, he's deliberately maintaining himself in public view. He's not being allowed to disappear. He's not allowing himself to be seen in private. He's not allowing himself to go home to be seen with his wife. He's maintaining his presence in public view at all times. All can witness and attest to Uriah not going home, and this essentially blows up David's conspiracy. And I see this as Uriah potentially holding David to account for his sin. I think he's potentially shaming David by not accepting his gifts and orders, and this isn't just about soldiers' honors we might assume on the surface. I tend to believe, according to how this is going down, 
he may full well, fully he may f fully be aware of what has happened. I think it's entirely plausible he knew what happened. He found out along the way. Picking up in verse 14, the scripture states, In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And in the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also fell. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, When you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king's anger arises, and if he says to you, Why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabeth? I just butchered that. Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on, on him from the wall so that he died at the beds? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archer shot at your servants from the wall. Some of your king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your tack against the city and overthrow it and encourage him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So since David's plan failed, he then conspired to have Uriah murdered to cover up his sin. The scriptures tell us that the wife of Uriah lamented for her husband when the news of his death reached her. And it's important to note that we're not told she lamented over any sin that she committed. Recall, David didn't send for Uriah to ask him for a certificate of divorce to marry Bathsheba. But that's not why he wanted Bathsheba, was it? All he had for her was lust. David took her, he used her, he sent her home. That's all he wanted. She was nothing more than a piece of meat to satisfy his appetite. But now after a per period of mourning, he does take her as a wife, and she will have the child. And this, in his mind, will in turn allow him to save face, and in his mind, it's not over and done with. Or so he thinks. Moreover, as we see in verse 25, David isn't even bothered by his actions. He doesn't think he's done anything wrong. He doesn't have a guilty conscience. Beginning in chapter 12 and verse 1, we see that the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children, and it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled, and against the man he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So in chapter 12, we see God, he's sending Nathan to rebuke David and shame him into repentance through imagery. David is symbolized as the rich man, Uriah is symbolized as the poor man, and Bathsheba is symbolized as the little one you lamb. All right? Is there any illustration to better characterize innocence than one little lamb? What does this illustration signify? When you think of a lamb, what do you think of? Defenseless? Helpless? Dependent upon a protection? Nothing about this description signifies shame or guilt or condemnation, does it? Those adjectives are not synonymous with a lamb. By the way, who else in the scriptures is portrayed as a lamb? This illustration would not be lost on a former shepherd boy. 
as king, her protection was his responsibility, and he forsook it for personal gain. Moreover, the same verb that is used to describe what happened to the lamb is what happened with Bathsheba. Took. Both were taken. There was no, we respectfully request your property. They were taken. That's the verb that's being used. There was no consent to the taking of the lamb from the poor man. If the poor man consented to the rich man, why then did David burst into anger? In verse 7, Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. So you are the man. So David at first doesn't realize Nathan's story is about him. He didn't feel any personal guilt until he was shamed for this parable. He was ready to throw down on behalf of somebody else. He just didn't honor Uriah and Bathsheba that way with that same sense of righteousness. Note too that throughout Nathan's rebuke, Bathsheba is consistently referred to as the wife of Uriah, even after having married David. I believe this too is indicative of her innocence. Nathan charged David for what he did to her and Uriah, not what he and Bathsheba did together. This distinction is right here in black and white. Do you see how this is unfolding? Where's the evidence of her presumed guilt? Bible students, myself included, in the past have often referred to the contents of these two chapters as David and Bathsheba's sin, but does Nathan refer to it in that manner in the Scripture? If we see in verse 13 that David repents of his transgression, and notice in verse 14 what Nathan explicitly says to David, Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Notice Nathan is not saying because by this deed y'all or you and the wife of Uriah have done, but what you, David, have done. Likewise, the child who is born to you shall die, not the child born to you both shall die. If this was consensual according to the law, where is her rebuke? It is David who is being singled out by the Lord through Nathan. It's not both of them. It's him. It's David. These are important lessons here. One, attempting to ignore or cover up our sins is just going to lead us deeper and deeper into a pit. Some have asserted that because the child died, God was punishing both David and Bathsheba for their alleged affair. I don't agree with that assessment at all. Let me explain why. I don't think that's what's being revealed here in the Scripture. David is learning a harsh lesson, as we all do when we sin. Bathsheba is wrapped up in this because of David. His sin's impacting her. It is unfair to insist that she too is being punished. Innocent people sometimes are left to suffer the consequences of other sins against them. I mean, that's the nature of sin. That's inherent with free will. Trials can come to us through no fault of our own. And let me just add, to concede that she's not an adulteress, but then shift and insist that she's now being punished because she didn't resist hard enough, that would just be gross. Unfortunately, I've heard Christians speak like that. It's a very questionable justification. To me, that would be no different than to insist something like, 
An innocent woman contracted HIV from her attackers because she didn't fight back hard enough and therefore punishment. That's no different than saying that. It's a very strange justification if we're going to apply that to Bathsheba. And if I may take a moment from that thought to segue into a modern application for us, as I mentioned to you at the start of this lesson, how we read these passages and derive our immediate pictures of the circumstances around David and Bathsheba could very well be indicative of how we view the world around us. In other words, nowhere does the scripture charge Bathsheba with any guilt. Yet so many of us have labeled her an adulteress. Point blank, I mean, that's, is that anything short of victim shaming? Men, there's a lesson in here from David that we need to pay attention to. So listen closely. It does not matter what she looks like. It does not matter how beautiful she is. It does not matter what she's doing. You don't have a right to any woman other than your wife. I don't care if you're unhappy. I don't care if you're bored. God is not going to send you another woman. No man has any right to another man's wife or even touch a woman without her consent. It was not Bathsheba's fault for what David sought to do. I don't care if a woman is being sinful. Sin does not justify more sin. For example, how many times have we turned on the news to see a pretty college girl raped after passing out drunk and being dismissive of it because Oh, well, she should have been drunk and dressed like a whore and it wouldn't have happened. How many times do we casually dismiss stories like that? Be that as it may, that unwise decisions like dressing immodestly and getting drunk can lead to consequences. Such does not equal consent or justify someone else taking sexual advantage, and how dare any of us casually dismiss it? As I can tell you right now, what if it were your daughter that was taken advantage of after a poor decision? In such an example. What if it were my daughter when she's old enough? What would my response be then? I bet the response would be different. And if our responses are different between our own loved ones and that of total strangers in the same set of, same set of circumstances, then, brethren, can we really lay claim to the fact that we love our neighbors as ourselves? Can we truly say we love our neighbors as ourselves? There is a reason Paul instructs Titus that older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness, and to urge the younger men to be self-controlled. I have seen it said it is not about how us men are wired. It is about being an example in our sanctification. Men, listen closely again. It is not a woman's responsibility in how you and I choose to behave. We are totally responsible for our choices. We don't get to point the finger. We are in full control of what we're doing. And if it is our habit to dismiss or justify the outcomes of sin, then it's no wonder so many of us have labeled Bathsheba an adulteress despite the scripture doing no such thing. Nor should we claim to love justice and mercy because where is justice and mercy in a wrongful accusation? During Nathan's rebuke and David's repentance, we see neither of these men attempt to minimize or justify his sin that occurred. There is no, well, Nathan, she's just too pretty. There is no, I can do whatever I want, Nathan. There is no, well, you know what, Nathan? I, you're right, but the urge is just too strong. I couldn't help it. There's none of that. None of that takes place. Pay attention to the fact that David himself never even tries to implicate Bathsheba. He never points the finger at her and says, you know what, Nathan, she was a willing participant. David doesn't do that. 
He takes full ownership. You know, unlike Adam, when he was confronted by God, he tried to point the finger back to God. We well, you know God is I mean, you gave me, she made me do it. David doesn't behave like that. David took full ownership. And I just want to say that's commendable. Because admission of guilt is the first step towards repentance. Now, I'm not going to read verses 15 through 25, but what we see happen in those passages is that the Lord indeed afflicts the child, and the child becomes sick. David fasts while the child is sick in hopes that God may relent of the punishment and spare the child. He doesn't. The child dies. David understands why, and he doesn't cry out. He picks himself up off the ground, and he continues climbing out of that pit. He comforts Bathsheba, and they have another son, Solomon. And we see that the Lord loved him. And out of the ashes of David's sin would arise another popular king whose wisdom is still instructing God's people today. And much can be said about the wife of Uriah. She endured a sexual attack, lost her husband, lost her child, became a wife to her abuser, and then bore him a son. To undergo those experiences and seemingly forgive David and be submissive to him as a wife is, I believe, a testament to her strength and a resolve in her faith. God lifted her up out of the depths of sorrow and showed her honor as she essentially became the queen mother of Israel. And I can't imagine the roller coaster of emotions that she must have endured here. I don't know if she relived the experiences every day or not, but she clearly demonstrates astounding strength. Considering 2 Samuel 14, as David was on his deathbed, it was Bathsheba whom Nathan depended upon to protect the throne of Israel for Solomon. David, too, trusted her judgment. And I don't think she would have done all this had it not been for some her, her strength and her forgiveness towards David. And it's in this forgiveness that she demonstrates that it's illustrative of the forgiveness that we have through Jesus and the fact that forgiveness is not earned. It's given. She is another example of the proof of God's deliverance. As I believe I've shown throughout this lesson, the scriptures never speak of her in a negative light. Consider 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. After becoming queen mother, she went to her son, King Solomon, to advocate on behalf of Adonijah. And when she entered Solomon's court, Solomon arose and bowed to her. He then has a seat brought in and sits down at his right hand. She's being shown honor. And consider in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6, long after her death, Matthew, guided by the Holy Spirit, commemorates her as one of the four unconventional women in the lineage of Christ. The Holy Spirit is showing her honor. And he shows her honor as the wife of Uriah, not the wife of David. So in turn, I think Uriah is being shown some honor too. Now continue, I just don't see evidence that Bathsheba was an adulteress. I think it's more likely that she was a faithful wife, a faithful mother, and a faithful servant of God. And it's peculiar to me how there seems to be a habit of partiality in how we remember certain persons in the Scriptures but not others. And when we do that, are we aware of any potential messages that we might be sending? Recall a couple of weeks ago I asked you why are we more apt to remember Rahab for her prostitution rather than her faith as described in Hebrews 11. And in contrast, we're more apt to remember Paul for his faith and his contributions to the Lord rather than his murderous terrorism. Is it consistent to be that way? Why is there a tendency to remember what of a woman who is unfairly taken advantage of and unjustly perceived like Bathsheba? If we have such tendencies, are we seeing the low downtrodden in the same way that Jesus does? Bible study is not a hobby. It's a discipline. And we need to take great care to see that the scriptures reveal because the impacts from its lessons are profound. Consequences from an incorrect understanding are no less profound, particularly in how it shapes our worldviews and how we see and love others. I want to share with you a quick story.